This conference is now being re recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York ASBA webinar, Extracurricular Activities Fund. Your presenters for today's program are Linda Wager from East Greenbush Central School District and Jay O'Connor from the New York State Education Department. Operator assistance is available anytime during this conference by pressing zero pound. A Q&A session will follow the presentation. You may send chat questions at any time during the presentation using the chat window. I will now turn on the call over to our sp first speaker, Jay O'Connor. Jay, please begin. Thank you, Matt. And if we might ask for uh, the toolbar in order to move the presentation, please. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who were expecting a different speaker, uh, uh, something came up with that individual, and so we were asked if we might uh, reprise the presentation that we gave to the treasurer's strand at this summer's Summer Business Manage Workshop. Uh, so that's why you'll note that the cover page still says July 2010. Uh, what we hope to do today is, is present some information about the extra classroom activity funds uh, talk a little bit about the roles of the different people involved, uh, talk about sales tax, and then try to address or answer any questions that you may have about um, these funds. Certainly in some districts there are a great deal of dollars passing through the Extra Classroom Activity Fund, but even in those districts where there's not a great volume of money going through, it's still important that you're complying with commissioner's regs and all board policies and certainly ensuring that uh, the money is handled properly and that the kids are getting the most out of the activity that they are participating in. The purpose of the extra classroom activity funds is, is really just uh, one idea and that is to teach kids how to run a business. Um, I think sometimes in, in talking to districts and, and residents from various districts, this idea sometimes gets lost in all of the fundraising activities and um, things that groups are being asked to do and whatnot. But when it comes down to it, the idea really is to give the students, whatever level they are at, uh, the opportunity to kind of learn how to run a business, what makes money, what uses money, how to handle money, and then certainly how to report those sales and collect sales tax and do all of the things that a business owner would need to do. And so it's important that this never be lost so that the kids and certainly the advisors and anyone involved with the extra classroom activity funds remember why it is that such funds are established. Some of the rules and regulations regarding extra classroom activity funds, the first one is important. They're to be operated by and for the benefit of the students. Sometimes you know, we have heard of advisors who are zealous in their uh, wanting to do uh, things with, with the group, but sometimes it seems as though then the advisor or others are kind of determining what the kids should be doing and what monies they should be raising and how they should be spending it. The kids need to set up the group. They need to run the group. The kids decide how they want to spend their money. And so we always should remember that, that this is for and operated by the students. Um, all clubs should be approved and published annually by the Board of Education. And it probably never hurts to have the board just review the list, so at least they know what clubs and groups are indeed operating in the district. And certainly then, if there's a new club or group that wants to be um, established, they will need to go to the board also. Certainly all the advisors need to be approved by the Board of Education. And then all fundraising activities shall be approved by a designee appointed by the Board of Education. Uh, in many instances, that may be a building principal, but somebody should be appointed by the board so that that person is looking at the fundraising activities that all of the groups in a building are doing 
to make sure that they're appropriate, to make sure that they're reasonable, and I think also to be sure that you know, if there's a, a club in a certain building in a certain area that those community members aren't being inundated with kids all the while coming to their door looking to sell candles or soap or, or something else so that um, you, know, you don't want to lose the community support for those groups. And so it's important that all fundraising activities should be reviewed and approved by that person appointed by the board. And it would certainly seem as though a building principal would be the reasonable position to do that. Continuing on with some of the rules and regulations and ideas for um, efficient extra classroom funds, we certainly encourage that advisors should attend training on an annual basis. Uh, maybe it's somebody in the business office or yourself as a business official who's providing that training, but it never hurts, um, we say, to, to go over that even if someone has been there for many years because there may be a new form, there may be a new way that you would want advisors and clubs to uh, be operating. Certainly, I think in some districts, after the start of the year, the advisors and even the student treasurers are invited to the training so that both the students and the advisors are hearing what it is they need to do, especially when it comes to handling money. Uh, the board needs to establish reporting guidelines. Uh, they need to indicate what bank should be used, who's authorized to sign uh, for extra classroom activity accounts. And certainly you want to make sure that's all in place before too much money starts flowing through the clubs and into uh, any bank account. And then the Board of Ed is responsible for, for appointing certain members of the faculty and the staff to these positions. And you can see them there. And Linda's going to talk a little bit more about what each of those um, positions does. So those are some of the rules and the regulations. Um, if you haven't seen them already, and we'll, we'll refer to it again at the end, there is a, a pamphlet on our website, State Ed's website, uh, regarding the accounting of extra classroom funds. And uh, we do have the commissioner's regulations in there uh, regarding these funds. So now uh, I will ask uh, Linda will talk about some of the positions involved. Thanks, Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jay said, there are several positions that are appointed by the board. The first one we're going to talk about is the central treasurer. Uh, the central treasurer is the person who maintains custody of all of the funds for all of the clubs. Uh, this person is responsible for maintaining a general ledger of all of the receipts and disbursements by club. And uh, they're also responsible for when they're going to issue a payment or when they're receiving funds, they're responsible for making sure that the proper authorization is obtained. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a while. But, but always, in order to make a disbursement or receive funds, um, it needs to be approved prior by the student treasurer and the faculty advisor. Uh, the central treasurer also reconciles the cash accounts each month, and a report of that of that reconciliation should be distributed to each club audit, uh, to each club faculty advisor. Uh, and one last thing is, we talk about the interest earned on the bank account. What the finance pamphlet um, guide suggests is that the interest be allocated by club. Um, that's a suggestion. I know sometimes also um, interest is just recorded in the student council, um, but there should be some some reasonable method for recording that interest. Okay, next is the faculty auditor, um, also appointed by the board. And uh, this person really has no part in the approval of payments, um, recording payments, issuing disbursements. Um, they're really just um, reviewing the records. Twice a year they come in and um, they review the central treasurer's records and uh, they make sure that everything is in order. Uh, they also should be issuing a report um, you know, that, that shows all of these, these items have been tested and that everything is uh, in the, the order it should be. The chief 
faculty counselor, that usually um, is the building principal. That person is, um, as Jay said, they're responsible for overseeing all of the fundraising events that take place in their building, making sure that they're proper. They do this by consulting with the faculty advisors and the students of the, um, the members of the club. Uh, each year, they're responsible for appointing the club advisor. And um, any new activity organizations, any new clubs, um, what they're responsible for is submitting a request to the Board of Education because the clubs should not be operating before the board approves them. And then finally, uh, after an audit, if there is a corrective action plan required, they're responsible for overseeing that and making sure those procedures are implemented. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, next is the faculty advisor. Um, this, the faculty advisor is appointed by the chief faculty counselor, otherwise you know, known as the principal. Um, this advisor works with the student officers, works with the members of the club. They develop any of their um, fundraising activities, their financial plans, what the club is going to do. Uh, they assist the student treasurer in the preparation of statement of losses, profit and loss. So whenever there's a fundraising event that takes place, there should be a, a, a careful reconciliation of how that fundraising event has played out. So um, you need to keep track of the items that have been purchased for sale and the sales that have taken place and how much money has come in and how much money has been spent. Um, the faculty advisor also supervises the disbursements. Uh, by making sure that the funds are there before they request a payment to be made. And they are responsible for determining which of the activities are subject to sales tax. And all of that information is supposed to be prepared and submitted to the central treasurer. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, sales tax in a while because while the faculty advisor is responsible with the student treasurer to submit all of that information to the central treasurer, um, a lot of times the money is just handed over to the central treasurer. And so we're going to talk a little bit about sales tax and helping them understand how it is to determine when they have a pot of money how much of that money is sales and how much of that money is sales tax if it hasn't been accounted for already. Okay, the activity treasurer is elected by the students of the club. Uh, this is a student and they are responsible for collecting the money. Um, they're responsible for paying all the bills. And um, they, they need to um, count all of the money. They need to approve the cash receipt form being submitted to the, tre uh, the fund treasurer. And they need to approve all disbursement forms before a payment can be made. And that's important that um, you remember, you'll see this all the way through, that the faculty advisor and the activity treasurer are the people that absolutely need to approve all receipts and all disbursements before they are submitted to the fund treasurer. Um, the activity treasurer should also be maintaining a ledger um, on their own, and then that should be supported by the reconciliation that is sent each month from the extra classroom treasurer. And then they, the activity treasurer also should be maintaining the file with all of the supporting uh, documentation for any of the events that they've, they've held. And then finally is the independent auditor. They'll come in once a year. They're appointed by the board. They'll perform an, an annual independent auditor, uh, audit, excuse me, and um, you will receive financial statements that are specific to the extra classroom activity fund. Okay, now Jerry's going to talk a little bit more about basic principles. Thank you, Linda. Uh, before we before we move on, I just uh, there's a question that was asked in in the chat room that we'll we'll try to address. Um, Kristen asked the question about guidelines on you know uh, what age to have extra classroom activity funds, and uh, often there's a question about this as to uh, whether or not kids 
under a certain age or below a certain grade are allowed to participate in extra classroom activity funds. Uh, it is often as a result of there's a mention of sixth grade in one of the commissioner's regulations. But what the department always says is that that sixth grade that's referenced in the commissioner's regs has to do with the district, whether the district operates beyond the sixth grade. But we always say that doesn't limit kids who are not yet in sixth grade from actually operating or being a part of an extra classroom activity fund. With that being said, I think the district and the administration and the board has to look at whether or not a group of second graders, for example, could reasonably expect to follow all the rules and the regulations and the board policies about an extra classroom uh, activity fund. Just because the kids are younger doesn't mean that the group can run any differently than the older kids in terms of following all the rules, regs, and district policies. So while there isn't any specific guidance that we can direct you to, we certainly would say I think that um, the board and the district should, should really review if a, a group of young kids come forward wanting to, to uh, be in an extra classroom and, and make sure that there is indeed the, the ability of those students to operate it just as it's supposed to be. Uh, the question has come up about the regulation that references sixth grade. Uh, that is Re Commissioner's Regs 172.2. And if you have seen the pamphlet or if you go to the pamphlet, for extra classroom funds after this session is over, you will see the commissioner's regs, including 172.2, are listed in there on page 32. Regarding some of the basic principles about extra classroom funds, um, as Linda talked about, it's important for central treasurer and the student activity treasurer for each club, uh, maintaining the separate sets of records that will certainly, we believe, help to uh, ensure internal controls and make sure that at the end of the month or the quarter or the year, the reconciliation can take place that needs to so that all the funds are accounted for. Uh, certainly all the accounts shall be audited annually. Linda talked about the role of the external auditor and certainly they are always looking at um, extra classroom funds. It, it's also good to know or important to know that um, at least in their first round of audits, the Office of the State Controller also for certain districts did look at their extra classroom activity funds as part of their audit of the district. And, and so it's possible going forward that if the controller is indeed back out in districts, that may be a, an area where they again are looking. So it's important that those records and those books are all kept up to date and current and certainly that they reconcile. And then the accounting system that your district uses uh, should be designed so that um, the students get the most educational return and yet keeps the money safe um, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't expose any of the kids to undue responsibility or unnecessary routine. So um, while you want to have checks and balances, you you, you, you want to be careful, I think, about having too many checks and balances so that the kids kind of lose track of where their money is supposed to go once it comes into the, into the group. One thing I didn't mention when I talked about just kind of the basic idea of extra classroom activity funds, and this has certainly come up in lots of districts, I think, around the state, is that, uh, you know, if you're have a question about whether an extra classroom activity fund is really a valid club, then certainly you should, if you're in the position to, ask some questions, do some investigating so that you don't end up with a club that's not really doing anything but perhaps um, passing money through for other purposes or, um, you know, is, is anybody is using just as a way to raise funds for something that the district really should be purchasing. Um, I know certainly I think we've, we've had the question before about uh, cheerleading clubs in terms of 
raising money so that they could buy uniforms, and there's always the question about you know, whether those uniforms are something that the district should be providing or whether the kids are potentially expected to purchase them. But you, you want to be sure that all of the clubs that you have are valid, and we'll talk a little bit in, in the future slides here about what to do if you have an inactive club. When it comes to handling the funds uh, in terms of the cash receipts, uh, certainly in some of these groups that are fundraising very regularly, there can be lots of money, uh, both quantity-wise and in terms of how often money is passing through the hands. Uh, oftentimes, those sources of funds are admissions for events that a group is sponsoring. Uh, it's often sales or fundraising campaigns, and it may also be donations that individuals or, or local community businesses or things might be giving to a particular extra classroom activity fund. And so certainly, I think as you're looking at the policies and procedures of the district, you want to be sure that they're clear so that the clubs know, regardless of uh, how the money is coming in, uh, what they need to do with it. But then also, as we'll, we'll see in the next couple of slides, what they might need to do for specific sources of revenue. For example, in our next slide, here we talk about if they're uh, putting on some event or a show of some kind uh, where they're charging admissions. Some of the things that they need to be thinking about and doing perhaps is the use of pre-numbered tickets and that each ticket seller should be given a definite number of tickets so that at the end, it can be reconciled against what's left and how much money has been collected. If possible, using different colors for each event. I think the third bullet is important, uh, that those people who are asked to be ticket sellers uh, not also be asked to watch the gate, because uh, it doesn't take much for someone to look away and for money or to disappear or tickets to disappear if you're using the same kind of tickets for multiple events. And so if possible, we always encourage that seller not be the same person as who's watching the gate. Uh, we, we always would say that a, a responsible adult ticket collector uh, should be available. I mean, you certainly can use your own discretion as to what a, who a responsible adult is in the district, but we think that certainly helps safeguard the funds and collection of the money. Um, certainly uh, ripping the tickets, uh, you know, most any event that you that you go to, even as an adult, from a, a ball game or a concert, uh, very often they rip the ticket in half. They keep half and give you a half uh, as a souvenir. So certainly uh, you should be doing that for extra classroom events. And then at the end of the night or the end of the event, the, uh, each ticket seller should return all of the tickets they didn't sell, all of the monies collected, and if possible, an accounting of the monies returned. Now, certainly we know that uh, things happen and on a Friday night or a Saturday night, it's, people aren't always interested in, in doing all that uh, or whatnot, but maybe if the least you do is, is take the money and you put it in a safe and then ask that ticket seller to submit something or a group to submit uh, a list of what each ticket seller sold and what they have left at the end. But it's important that at some point in time, uh, the group should have a good count of tickets sold, tickets not sold, uh, and how much money was collected so that they can be sure that it all reconciles appropriately. When it comes to sales, which of course for many groups this is their, this is their big fundraising um, way of, of generating money, uh, certainly, the club should be using pre-numbered receipts in duplicate so that uh, one can be given and one can be retained. And then, um, as you see, in some of some cases, for example, uh, in the event of a candy sale, uh, it may not be the most practical to use duplicate numbered receipts, but somehow in advance of that sale, there should be some method devised so that the group the student treasurer uh, 
maybe the faculty, treasurer, those people can all um, have a way at the end of the, the day of reconciling and knowing how much was sold, how much money they took in. And, and that will be important also as Linda will talk about in a couple of minutes for uh, when you're determining how much sales tax needs to be collected. And so certainly uh, we understand that the use of those receipts may not be always the, the most practical way to do that, but you should have some method devised, or the group should, so that they can be sure when things really get brisk in terms of sales that they're still able at the end of the sale to determine how much money they took in. When a group buys, for example, candy that they're going to be selling for the next couple of months or for the remainder of the year, certainly you know, there, there's the expectation that they will, they will have inventory. Uh, that should be, as you might reasonably expect, be stored in a safe place. Uh, certainly if it's candy or other types of meltable goods, they probably ought to be stored somewhere where they're not in the direct sunlight or next to the register if possible, but somewhere safe and somewhere where um, maybe there's limited access. Maybe the faculty advisor has a key and uh, the guideline is that uh, he or she goes in with uh, the student treasurer to bring out what they need each afternoon for the sale. But it should be something so that that inventory is, is safeguarded when um, it's not being sold. And then we, we do have in the pamphlet what we call an inventory control log so that uh, when they're raising money and maybe they have um, purchased, uh, again, T-shirts or candles or things and they're, they're not going out the door right yet, uh, there ought to be some means by which the group can track those so that they always know how many they have, they know how many have gone out the door, and then that will also allow them when they need to perhaps reorder and be able to do that more efficiently and not just order so many Baby Ruth bars that when it comes to June 30th, they have so many they don't know what to do with. So it, it could also help control inventory that way. And then finally, the deposit of funds. Um, the activity treasurer prepares the duplicate pre-numbered receipt um, that's going to be deposited into the club account by the central treasurer. Uh, the central treasurer then uh, prepares the bank deposit slips and makes sure that the money is uh, deposited into the correct account. Central treasurer should give something back to the club, such as a duplicate deposit slip, so that uh, the club has a record that the central treasurer has made the deposit. And then um, we say the activity treasurer should file that receipt, the bank deposit slip, and then, if applicable, if there is one, a statement of profit and loss. I don't think, if you're in the business office, that you can ever too strongly encourage clubs to make sure that once that money comes in, it gets deposited. I think we all have heard the stories of money that was in a teacher's drawer and then disappeared, or money that was collected in September and suddenly um, somebody finds it for deposit in May. So I think one of the most important pieces of the board policy and procedures is the idea that that money gets deposited as quickly as possible after the event so that you hopefully try to minimize how much time that money is sitting somewhere in a closet or in a, the bottom of a desk drawer. Uh, we think you should always you know, remind the advisors and even the the treasurers of the club, you know, they shouldn't be taking the money home with them. I know sometimes it's not feasible so much on a Friday or Saturday night to, to get in and get that money somewhere safe, but you should try to minimize that as much as possible so that um, hopefully you minimize any theft or chance of theft or, or just the possibility that somebody sets a bag down and it gets picked up and uh, you know, thrown in the garbage because it was with some other things by accident, whatever the case might be. But the deposit of funds is really a point to, to emphasize when you're doing your training and when you're setting up any board policies and procedures. There we go. 
Okay, next I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the purchasing process and making the payments. Um, in the ideal world, a purchase order system should be used uh, for the extra classroom activity funds. If a purchasing order system is used, um, it is important, as I said before, it is important that both the activity treasurer and the faculty advisor approve this, this purchase order. Once that's done, the purchase order, the original purchase order, can go to the vendor, and that's the authorization to purchase and for the vendor to send the goods. Um, as with any purchasing system, when the goods are received and the bill arrives, it's important that both the activity treasurer with the faculty advisor supervising um, go through that bill and go through the goods to make sure that they reconcile um, everything received against what they're being charged for. Once it's determined that uh, there are no discrepancies, then it would be proper for the student treasurer with the faculty advisor to prepare the payment order form. And then that's with the bill is forwarded to the central treasurer who prepares the check. Okay, once the central treasurer files the, the payment order form in the invoice, they prepare the check. Uh, it is recommended that the, um, the check then goes back to the activity treasurer, I'm sorry, to the student treasurer. So um, the central treasurer will file the payment order form and the invoice, and then that check is going to go back to the student treasurer. The student treasurer will file the file documentation with their records, and they're responsible for mailing the check. Then that way, the club members, the student treasurer, knows that the payments, the funds have been deposited, the orders have been received, and the payment has been issued. There are occasions where advances um, need to take place or transfers are done. In the case of transfers, it's usually um, in the case where there's a new club starting out and they need to have a fundraising event and in order to purchase goods, um, they will sometimes get a transfer or an advance from another club. Um, say for instance the student council. That it's very important with transfers especially uh, that that is a disbursement. It's a form of disbursement. Even though money is not changing hands, it is um, being recorded in the ledger really as a disbursement out of the club. So it needs to be approved by both the student treasurer and the faculty advisor. Uh, in the case of advances, there are occasions where there may be a trip and an advisor uh, needs to take money with them. Uh, let's say they're going to buy lunch out of the um, club funds um, and they're not sure how much that's going to be. An advance um, should be detailed. It should be signed, signed off by the club advisor and the student treasurer. And when the funds are returned, there should be able to be a reconciliation of both the receipts and the change that is returned with it, or in the case of, of um, you know, uh, more than the advance being spent, then the receipts need to be returned and a payment needs to be issued for the balance of that. But it's real important that that all be documented and approved by the faculty audit, uh, advisor and the student treasurer. Now, a lot of times there are questions about inactive clubs. When a club has no activity for a full year, it's considered inactive. Um, so, you know, the purpose is that these clubs um, have activities during the year that the students are learning how to run a business, and, and part of that is in fundraising events. So if there's nothing being done and there is no activity for a year, that club is inactive, and the board can decide to close out that club. If there are funds available in that club, uh, for instance, and there is no activity, the board then also authorizes what, what can be done with those funds. But certainly, if the, the club is going to cease operation and there are members and that's planned for, then the club members, and it should be documented, documented in their board member minutes, can decide what they want to do with the remaining funds. 
Sales tax is a big issue when it comes to extra classroom activity funds. Um, the extra classroom activity fund is a separate entity from the district and therefore is not tax exempt. Um, it is the responsibility of each faculty advisor to know which of the activities um, that the club undertakes are subject to sales tax. And it is also their responsibility with the student activity treasurer to calculate the sales tax uh, when, they're having, you know, when they're having these fundraising events. Um, in the finance pamphlet too, there is a listing of typical activities and whether they are considered taxable or not taxable. Um, but every year I think it's a good idea, especially with new advisors coming in, I think it's a good idea to provide a list of some of the uh, common fundraising events, provide a list to the uh, advisors as to what type of activities are taxable and what is non-taxable. When you have fundraising events that is um, involving the resale of goods, first of all, every um, extra, extra activity fund should file a DTF-17 form with the Department of Taxation and Finance. And that basically identifies you as a vendor. Um, that's the first form that needs to be filed. And with that, you'll receive a, a, a number from the Department of Taxation and Finance that you will always reference when you're filing your sales tax returns. Uh, there is a form, ST20, which is called a resale certificate. This form is used when um, a club is purchasing merchandise that they're going to resell. And when they submit this form ST20 to the vendor, then they can make this purchase tax-free because when they sell these goods, they'll be collecting and remitting the sales tax for them. And both of those forms are available on the uh, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance website. As far as the sales tax go, um, student organizations, they must collect the sales tax on receipts for all sales of taxable merchandise. Uh, there is no way of getting around this. I, I've been asked the question um, several times, okay, what can I do to get around this? It, there is no getting around it. The purpose of the fund and the clubs, you'll remember, is to teach students how to run a business, and sales tax is part of running a business. So. Um, they need to learn to collect and calculate sales tax, and they also need to learn how to file sales tax returns and, and remit the payments with that. As I said, in the finance pamphlet on page 12, there is a listing there of um, some typical activities and what their taxable status is. Okay, and there is a question here. There is a question regarding sales tax and do the clubs file this or the district? Um, I will tell you, I'm just going to go back a slide here. This form DTF-17, that's in order to register with the Department of Taxation and Finance as a vendor. Um, I will tell you in that my district, I filed that on behalf of each of the classroom, extra classroom funds. So we have two funds. Well, we have one fund. We have one at the high school and one at the middle school. They're both operating clubs. I filed a separate DTF-17 for each. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessary or not, but I did get two sales tax ID numbers. Uh, so you can certainly uh, check with the department on that. As far as the resale certificates, the form ST20, um, that would be done by, by the clubs. So if, if I'm part of a drama club and we're going to make a purchase um, of items for resale, that, that ST20 can be filled out by the club and submitted. A copy of it should go to the extra classroom treasurer, the central treasurer as well. And, uh, and then that way the, the purchases can be made. Um, I hope that answered Nancy's question. And Nancy, if, if it didn't, you can certainly follow up with that. Uh, there's another question regarding sales tax returns and the requirements for filing. Um, is it required to be done quarterly or annually? And that is dependent on the amount of sales. So initially, when you file your first sales tax return, it will be done on a quarterly basis. 
but um, I know that, that is, there is a determination by sales amount, total sales, that um, the department will um, instruct you as to whether it needs to be done quarterly or annually. I'm just reading through some questions here. So, um, one, uh, another question we have is, what is the best way to obtain startup change for the ticket seller? Shall we do an advance for this? And I, I think that probably that would be the best way is um, you issue um, you know an advance form that is approved by both the faculty advisor and the student treasurer. Then that way there is record of money going out of the club. And, it, and then when you're reconciling at the end of the event, that will be part of the reconciliation. Okay. Now there's a question from Monica uh, regarding if the club buys something and pay tax on it when they buy it, do they just pay tax on the profit when they sell it? And you know, I'm going to, um, on that, I'm going to have to refer you to the Department of Taxation and Finance um, because my understanding is that on the sales, uh, it, it would be your responsibility to file the ST20 in order to make the purchase tax free. However, on any sales, if you pay sales tax on it, you're still making sales and I think it's determined, the sales tax is determined on your sales. So I don't think you would be paying it just on the profit, but I would advise you to uh, call and confirm that with the Department of Taxation and Finance. It's just important that if a club buys something that they are going to buy for the club that they're not going to sell, then you know you you want to discourage the advisors of the clubs from coming to the district office and asking to use the tax exempt form because they're not tax exempt when they're buying something. Um, for the club or on behalf of the club. But also then, as, as Linda has mentioned, you want to try to avoid where a group, for whatever reason, uh, ends up paying tax, sales tax, twice. So certainly that may be where the importance of a resale certificate comes in so that the students don't end up, for whatever reason, reason paying sales tax when they purchase and then again if they make a sale. Okay, we do have another question here from Ken, which reads, what do you do when the parents of student treasurers do not want their children responsible for mailing checks? They're fearing any consequences if the students lose the checks. And that's a good question. Um, one of the things that I will say is that everything that the student treasurers do is under the supervision of the faculty advisor. Uh, so the student treasurer is not just expected to uh, take care of things on their own. They're working directly with an advisor through every step of the way. Uh, so I guess in this situation, if you have a specific situation where the parents absolutely do not want the student treasurer mailing the check, um, I still think that the check should go from the, the central treasurer back to the faculty advisor and student activity treasurer, and together they can mail it, or the faculty advisor can take care of mailing it, but the student treasurer should know that it's being done and be at least an observing part of the process. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about calculating sales tax. As I said, it is the responsibility of the faculty advisor and the student treasurer when they're having a, fu a fundraising event to calculate how much is taxable sales and how much is sales tax. Um, and this might be um, an example that you want to provide to them because a lot of times people have um, a difficult time trying to make that calculation and it's, it's a pretty simple one and this might be a, a guide that you can use going forward um, but it should be provided to the faculty advisors and the student treasurers and let's say they have a big sale and uh, or they have some sort of sale and they take in nine hundred dollars what you're going to do is you're going to take the total funds. They don't know how much of this is sales and how much is sales tax, but they know they have to pay sales tax. So you take the total funds and you divide it by 1.08, um, and that will give you the, the taxable sales amount. If you take your total funds of, say, $900, 
and subtract that taxable sales amount of $833.34, you come down to $66.66. .66. That represents what is your sales tax. And the way you can double check that is by taking your taxable sales amount of 833.34 and multiplying it by 8%, that will equal the 66.66. Add those two together and you're back to the $900. Um, so that's, this is just like a, an easy reference sheet that you may want to keep for yourself as a central treasurer, but also provide to faculty advisors and student treasurers as well. There is a question here about if a group goes on a field trip and they, and they eat out, do they pay sales tax? Um, I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, remember that the, um, the club is, not, is a separate entity from the district um, and is not tax exempt. Would you agree with that, Jay? Right, and, and, and probably you will find in many instances the restaurants or fast food chains or things will not necessarily accept any kind of sales tax exempt form, even if it was for the, a school group. But certainly when it comes to extra classroom, yes, it, I think we would expect that uh, they're going to pay for the Whopper plus whatever tax on it. Okay, and then the next question we have is, um, are you able to subtract your cost from the sales amount? And um, the way I'm interpreting this question is um, you've got sales and, and someone paid for some items. Uh, no, you should not be um, subtracting items out and netting your sales. Uh, there should be a full accounting for your entire event. So you will have your expenses that you've had to pay in order to purchase the items that you're selling, and then you will have your sales, the, the money that has come in from the sales. Um, that should all be really accounted for on a profit and loss statement. And then if someone is, if someone has purchased an item, say cups, um, that was used during an event, um, they can be reimbursed by um, a, a disbursement form being completed and signed off by both the faculty advisor and the student treasurer. Uh, next, uh, oh, wait a minute, we have another question. What if the organization you purchased the goods from charged you tax, even though you provided them with a resale certificate? Do you still charge the tax higher amount? Um, well, I believe if you have provided them with a resale certificate, you should be approaching the company before you pay that bill because the tax should not be on that invoice. So before the disbursement order is approved, someone should be contacting that company to get that straightened out. And as far as charging the tax on the entire amount, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about the, the yearbook. Yes, you would, charge, you would still charge the full sales tax on the price of the yearbook as you're selling it. Do you agree with that? I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question. We're getting a little off track, but we want to try to answer some of these questions as we go. Um, what is the best way to handle cash tips, say, to a bus driver? Um, you know, those those should probably be minimal, and I would say that in that case, um, there should just be documentation of it. Do you agree, or is there another? If if, if there's a field trip and um, they they give the um, bus driver a tip of five dollars or something like that, um, I would think that that type of thing would be minimal. And I'm guessing that there's not money. You're not going to certainly um, issue a cash receipt or you know a disbursement form in order to give the uh, bus driver a tip. But I would say try to keep those at a minimum and make note of what that is. And that should be um, noted in the records in the supporting documentation for the event. And, and probably, if, if you could, that should be when the kids or the, the kids, the students in the group vote on how they want to spend their money. And they say, we want to use the money to pay for a trip to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, that probably part of that 
as you're thinking about it, ought to be include the do, the money that you might uh, tip the driver, so that in theory the the students would have voted on using the money that way. I, I think you don't want to just have you know somebody pulling money out of the student group to tip them uh, without the whole group at least acknowledging that that's part of their expense. Yeah, that's a good point. Another question we have from Cynthia is, uh, so if we buy t-shirts and then we resell, must we pay the full amount on the whole purchase? And the way I'm understanding that question is, if you're buying t-shirts and you're reselling them, say you're buying them for $5, and hopefully you're issuing a resale certificate so that you're not charged tax on those when you're buying them. If you charge, if you then sell, turn around and sell them for $10, you should be you should be collecting the tax on ten dollars. So you would be collecting say ten dollars and eighty cents for a shirt. You'd be recording your taxable sales as ten dollars and your sales tax as eighty cents, and that's what you'd be remitting. Um, another another question is uh, that we briefly mentioned valid clubs, and where can you find in more information about what makes a club valid or not valid? There are certain things to remember in um, establishing a club. All clubs, as we said in the beginning, need to be approved by the board. So therefore, um, the, the chief fiscal advisor, who <laughs> I don't even remember if that's what we call them, uh, but the building principle. The building principle, if, if a club is going to be formed, the request is made to the building principle. The building principle then submits a request to the Board of Education with um, what the club is, the purpose of the club, how the club intends to operate, and um, basically the types of officers that the club will have and the members. Uh, the Board of Education has to approve that before a club can actually start doing business. And uh, the other thing we mentioned about clubs is when they're inactive. And if a club is not operating, if they're not doing anything all year, they are considered inactive, and then that should be closed out. And, and you know, I think the the board certainly has the should have the opportunity and and, and the discretion to say we're not sure that's a valid club. It, it doesn't sound like it's like all of our other clubs. Maybe we want to ask more questions. Maybe we want to have them rework uh, what it is they they stand for, or what they're going to do. So there, we don't have probably any specific guidance printed anywhere to point you to. I, we understand what you're asking, but I, I think part of it, you know, has to be what they might call the smell test, where if it if it Everything looks as though it's a it's a valid club and it's for the purposes of kids learning how to run a business and it looks good and and they're ready to go. Then it probably is. But if it's uh, you know you have one uh, individual or parent or faculty member simply coming in to ask about it and you know there aren't any kids with that person or you're not hearing anything like that, then you may want to question what it is that that club is really being established for. But you have, you have latitude in terms of, um, of what those clubs could be. And the other thing, certainly I think your external auditor may also be able to be a source of guidance in terms of uh, what they might consider a valid club, what they look at when they audit those funds, and maybe that will also give you some, some hints. Okay, uh, one more question we have um, is regarding uh, if the club is raising money for the purpose of donating funds to a nonprofit organization, do you need to collect sales tax on those events? Um, and really those are two separate things. Uh, if you're, the fundraising event is one um, issue and then the donation is another. So if the club decides that they're going to fundraise by selling something that is a taxable item, yeah, you need to um, collect and remit the sales tax on that. Um, and then you can make a donation. Um, a donation is a disbursement, so therefore that disbursement needs to be approved. Um, and that would come out of 
the funds that were raised that are not um, that are not due to New York State for sales tax. Uh, then we have another question: Can the graduating class funds be issued to a post-graduate account not related to the school? Um, and this school district makes the, the students use the funds or transfer them to student council. But um, this is a question that comes up every year, and that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, and I, I get, you know, the, student, the members of the class decide what is going to be done with their funds. That being said, uh, when you're talking about a postgraduate account, um, that's certainly not something that the extra classroom treasurer wants to, or, or that the, um, the extra classroom fund wants to continue to account for um, in subsequent years. So if the graduating class decides that they want to issue this check into, uh, I don't know, an account that they've opened for a specific purpose, say a class reunion in future years that will be monitored by them, I would say, although I don't think it's the greatest idea, I would say that as long as this is all documented, what the class wants done, and it's approved in the proper form, uh, that they should be able to do that. Do you agree with that? I do. I, I think what you want to avoid is just having or hanging on to funds because somebody says, you know, in 10 years we're coming back, can you hold on to our class of 2010 funds so that we can use them in 2020 for our reunion. You know, I, I think you, you want to just let everybody know, as, as Linda has said, that decide now what you want to do with them because in another year um, they're going to be inactive. I, I think the other issue that sometimes comes up is that, that you know, districts hold on to funds for graduating classes, you know, and then two or three years down the road an alumni who graduated in that year calls and says, um, you know, can we now use that money or can you send that money to me because I'm getting the reunion together or something. And I think that's another case in point where you, the importance of after a year making sure if the group never decided or never voted where to spend that money, you want to get that money back into whether there is student council or honor society or something so that um, you, you avoid that issue. But I would, I would agree with, with what Linda said that, you know, if the graduating class on that last day of school decides that votes to write a check to, to Joe who's going to keep the money for their uh, future events, then if they've done that all right, that's um, probably okay. And as Linda said also, though, you want to, then be out of the business of accounting for those funds once once you write that check. That becomes Joe's responsibility, not the extra classroom activity fund of his school. Okay, there there's one more question regarding uh, how do we go about paying the sales tax? There is a sales tax form. Contact um, the Department of Taxation and Finance. There is a, I'm going to say it's a quarterly form that you'll first fill out. Um, and it, it, um, it, you're required to report total sales and then what your taxable sales are and the amount of tax collected. And then there is a, um, a credit for if you're paying your sales tax on time, you, you get like a little discount. Um, and that's all part of the calculation. And then and the directions are right on there to um, to submit the form, where to submit the form, and how much the, you'll be calculating the payment and how to make the check out. And I should know that form right off the top of my head. And, and right now I'm at a loss for it. But um, uh, Deborah is asking me that question. And Deborah, I will make sure I get that form number to you. The next question is regarding when a club votes to go on a trip and also votes to buy lunch and souvenirs while on that trip, can the club vote to give each student a certain amount for lunch and souvenirs? 
Should the students be required to submit receipts for such purchases, or will it be sufficient for the club to vote and just issue each student a check? Um, the club, when they raise funds, can decide what they want to do with the funds. Uh, and remember, this is where the faculty advisor comes in and offers guidance. Um, I don't think it's always a great, my personal opinion is that I don't think it's always a great idea to say, okay, we're going to give each person $20. That can be done if that's what the club, um, if that's what the club decides they want to do and it's documented in the minutes of the club, that can be done. Another suggestion, and hopefully the faculty advisor will come up with another suggestion, is basically that they decide to go to lunch as a group and that um, maybe this is where an advance comes in for the advisor to, and the student activity treasurer to take money with them and pay for the lunch at that time. Um, but as I said, you know, the students decide how to raise the funds, how, many, how much money they're going to raise, and um, they also decide what it is they want to do with the money. So in the end, the ultimate decision is theirs. Um, oh, thank you. And someone just sent me the form that for the filing of the sales tax report. Um, that is the ST100. And I should have known that. Um, the annual report is called the ST101. And thank you to Karen, both Karens, for that information. Um, the next issue um, is that um, the, the person is asking that they're finding it hard to believe that the club in their last year, such as a graduating class, would be allowed to, to authorize an expenditure to a person for a future event. There would be no control of the event. I agree with that, but what we're saying is that if there is documentation from the members of that class, if the class approves this sort of thing to be done and there is documentation of that, a check can be issued, but then the extra classroom activity fund is out of it completely. So if, like Jay said, 10 years down the road, Joe no, no longer has the money, well then that's an issue that people will need to take up with Joe, and the extra classroom activity fund is no longer involved. As soon as that check is issued, the class approves it and the check is issued, the fund is no longer involved. Right. The, the responsibility really kind of ends once that once that check goes out. But as as long as the group has has voted and it's all documented, then whether it's making a check to Joe for that final thousand dollars or making a check to the local fireman's group for a thousand dollars, whatever the case might be, as long as the group has followed the rules and they vote on it up to that, that point, then we would say that's what. That's what's important from the perspective of the district and the extra classroom activity fund. Then, as, as Linda said, if down the road Joe has squandered the money, his, his fellow classmates take it up with him and they don't come back to the district because that was their, that was their decision at that time. But certainly we, we, we understand where it could sound unusual. Uh, the next question is regarding the credit that they receive on the sales tax form. Should that credit go back to each activity group, and should this be a part of the sales tax calculation that the students do? Um, as far as the credit goes, that is based on the total taxable sales and the amount of sales tax. So that's as a whole, that's all of the clubs combined, say, for the quarter or the year. Um, so I don't see where the, um, the students of each club are going to be able to do that. However, that credit, yes, I guess could go back against each group, um, but I will tell you that it's, it's a minimal amount and um, usually, you know, I, I don't know what's done um, everywhere else, but, but uh, it, it's really a minimal amount and maybe um, it could be allocated the same as interest is against each club, you know, to each club, or it could go to one club, the student council or, or whatever is decided. Um, there's a question regarding should the claims auditor be involved in reviewing the deposits and payments? And um, I certainly don't think that's a bad idea. 
Um, that being said, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure, like, how, it, I'll tell you how it works in our district. Our claims auditor is here once a week. Our um, extra classroom activity funds are, are, um, are doing work on a daily basis and issuing checks and, and receiving payments and that sort of thing on a daily basis. So for us, that doesn't work. Um, I, I guess for reviewing payments, um, I don't think it's a bad idea for a record of the payments to be sent to someone. Um, just in order to make sure that the payments that are going out are proper. Um, do you have an opinion on that? I, I think that's, that's, I think what Linda said is good. I, I think it's, you know, the claims auditor is, it, it's not the same role as they play for the district, certainly. But um, in terms of perhaps another individual looking at that and uh, looking for any issues or things that might come up that they have seen or might be more likely to catch because of the work they do for the district, uh, that might be valuable. Okay, another question is, um, what if the club members vote to distribute the balance in the club to each member in the club? Can they do that? And, and you know, the answer is yes, they can do that. Um, it has to be documented, uh, but the members of the club are the people who have done the fundraising and taking, taken um, part in the activities all year. Uh, they can vote to have a pizza party for themselves. They can vote to uh, make a donation to a, a worthwhile charity, um, or they can vote to split the money up. Um, it, it, you know, most clubs don't um, operate in that way, but I would say as long as it's documented, documented uh, in the minutes, that actually can be done. And, and I think what, you know, as the adult, the faculty advisor, or if you hear in the business office that, you know, there's, a, there's talk about a group wanting to spend money or do something that you might know to be illegal or something that's really questionable, uh, there's no reason why you can't raise that question. I think you know, while we always say that the kids, the students vote on how they want to spend the money, um, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with the idea that somebody might have to step in if all of a sudden it looks like the group wants to spend the money on something that is, is problematic. But for the most part, you know, as Linda said, if, if, if it's all documented and the, and the kids vote on how they want to do it, whether it's to give each other something or, uh, you know, as the next question asks about a scholarship for a particular student, uh, certainly worthy causes and certainly um, nothing there that we would ever say, you know, as long as the kids vote that they couldn't give the money to those, those um, items or those folks. And then we have one more question. People seem to be struggling with this, and it, it, is, um, it, it really is a difficult issue. Uh, if a graduating class decided to put their funds in an outside account, does this have to go before the board? Um, I think the technical answer is no, but I think that it's probably a good idea that the Board of Education be aware that this type of thing is occurring because um, they may have something to say about it. Uh, so I don't think that that would be a bad idea to um, seek the advisement of the board on that. Uh, but, but technically, I believe that once the students, the, the club is approved and their operation is approved by the board and what they're doing, um, once they decide what to do, um, I believe as long as it's properly documented that that's okay. That being said, I do agree in this case because it's a little unusual that it may be a good idea for uh, something like that to, to go before the board um, so that they are aware because in the end, although this is a separate entity from the district, the board does, is responsible for oversight of the extra classroom activity fund. 
And um, the next question is regarding um, can the central treasurer request copies of the minutes to support donations or expenditures? And I would say absolutely yes to that, um, especially when there's something in question um, as to, uh, you know, is this being done properly? Um, absolutely. Minutes are supposed to be kept of every, minute, every meeting that the uh, club has. And so if the club decides in that meeting to do something, it should be documented. And then absolutely that can be used as support uh, for whatever donations. And that's, that becomes a really good idea when it's the end of the school year and the students are going out on vacation summer vacation and there are still going to be bills that are going to be paid. If that's documented in the minutes that um, certain things are expected and, and you know roughly the amounts and that sort of thing because typically we run into during the summertime where bills come in that need to be paid and the students are already gone. So um, that's where those minutes become really important and they do support the expenditures that are being made. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll keep moving with the slides, but please feel free to continue to ask questions and we'll certainly try to uh, get to as many as we can. Just a few few last items uh, when it comes to donations. Um, if it's specific to a club, then uh, the club should accept it and it should be recorded in the minutes of that club that Linda just emphasized. So if somebody wants to give uh, $1,000 to the Honor Society at the high school, uh, the Honor Society at their next meeting should, as part of their minutes, um, show that the kids voted and they accepted it, uh, that donation. And, and certainly we always suggest that the, the club send a thank you note to the donor so that uh, the donor knows that not only did they receive the money, but that certainly there is appreciation for it. Uh, when it comes to lotteries, uh, you, you, you should discourage the groups from getting too close to the lotteries. Uh, you know, they, New York State looks at those as games of chance and generally prohibited unless you have a license to do that. So uh, for the most part, I think uh, the lotteries um, you might stay away from. Sometimes you know, there is the question of, of raffles. And um, I think as I just looked through here in the thought we had raffles in our sales tax guide in the pamphlet, but um, I guess we don't. So you, you want to just be careful about getting into anything where somebody might um, challenge whether or not the district or the club is running a game of chance and whether or not they're really uh, eligible to do that. Uh, when it gets into trips, this sometimes is a, is a gray issue because it gets to be a question of whether it's a school district trip or is it a board sanctioned trip or not? But certainly the, the trips should go to the board for their approval and uh, should be coordinated with folks in the business office to be sure that there is uh, proper insurance coverage and those kind of things. Uh, trips trips can be a, a tricky, tricky matter. And so certainly if you have a question about a field trip, uh, please feel free to call, call, call us at management services and we might be able to give you a little guidance or advice based on the previous questions that we have had. And then certainly if, if, the, if there appears to be a contract involved with something that the club wants to do, um, you know, that should really go to the district's purchasing agent. Uh, this might be the case, for example, with uh, yearbook club or a group that's uh, bringing in uh, a performer there may be some kind of contract, and you know, probably many of you have stories of where the club went out and on their own signed the contract, and then after the performers there or the, the 27 boxes of yearbooks appear at your front door, suddenly they walk in and say, oh, by the way, uh, the contract says we need to do this, and you're, you're trying to figure out how to do that. So I think as part of your procedures and policies, you want to get out front of that and say, if you think there's going to be a contract involved, uh, the business office and the purchasing agent should be involved with that uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the question is, uh, does the board need to approve donations? Um, I think we would say that the board does not need to uh, 
accept or approve donations for an extra classroom group like they do for donations to the school district, but that the club itself should accept that donation and that should be recorded in the minutes of the meeting where they do that. Similarly, a thank you note should come from the club, uh, perhaps rather than the district to whoever the donor is. But I don't believe that those would need to go to the Board of Ed for their approval or acceptance. Um, the question about the 50-50 raffles or the raffling of a basket considered a games of chance. I, I think I think they might be, um, but you wanna. There's a. I think there's an agency, the New York State agency. I think that I don't know if it's taxation or finance. Somebody oversees that. Um, maybe what I would ask with that question is at the end of the presentation, I'll give my email address, and so if you want to send that question, um, I'll try to try to search down an answer for you. I, I think they might be considered a game of chance, but I don't say that with 100%. Certainty. Uh, the same thing, uh, the question uh, from Tanya about the use of, of raffles. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a line there between I think what becomes a game of chance and what becomes uh, something that maybe an extra classroom group could do. And I'm pretty sure I even have a note on that somewhere back at my office. So again, if, if you would email me, I'll give you my email address. Um, I'll do my best to, to get an answer back for you, or at least an opinion. There's a question about uh, some sample bylaws and, and charters. Uh, we do have some samples of, I guess, closer to board policy and some regulations, although I think you could probably take from some of that. Uh, that's in our pamphlet number two, it's in the back. Um, so there are some samples there, although that may be at a higher level than uh, what you're looking for, Ken. But you know, the other thing may be even just to, uh, you could check with your, your local even ASBO chapter. There may be other districts that have some of those that they could share with you. Uh, but there are some samples, at least, of um, board policies and regs. I know that's not really what your question is asking, but there are some samples in the pamphlet. I don't think we have necessarily samples of the bylaws and charters down to the group level. But again, I think if you could uh, put an inquiry out to some of your surrounding colleagues and or maybe an ASBO chapter, I suspect you'll, you'll get um, plenty. Uh, just these these were recent in July, but we still call them recent. Uh, some of the questions that we've had at the department about extra classrooms. Uh, can the district treasurer also be appointed as the central treasurer? Uh, I think our answer is there there isn't necessarily anything that that prohibits that. And you know there are, I think some some pluses to that as opposed to just uh, somebody else that may or may not have experience or may not have uh, the skills that you would want in a central treasurer. So I don't know that there's anything that you reason why you couldn't do that. But again, I think that's a district by district decision. It, you know, some people, some districts find folks who are, have nothing to do certainly with the business office or anything else who make wonderful central treasurers. And so I would, I think you could consider the district treasurer but there isn't any requirement or prohibition that, that we're aware of. Um, a question that, that had come up prior to our presentation in July was, and, and Linda talked a little bit about this, whether each club or activity needed to be registered with New York State as a vendor. Um, I think, Linda, you said that you have each of the two clubs here, high school and middle school, registered with New York State. That's again, I think, a question that depends on the specifics of your di district. Um, certainly, in some conversations with districts that had, you know, have 30 or 40 buildings, it may not be practical or feasible for every building to be registered at 
so at one point during the summer, I did have a chance to talk with a gentleman over at the Department of Taxation and Finance, and he didn't. He kind of said, you know, there aren't any necessarily hard and fast rules from their perspective, but he certainly encouraged any district that had a question about that to call them, and uh, the folks at the Department of Taxation and Finance would talk to you on an individual basis about what might be reasonable for your district. So I'll uh, provide a 1-800 number also at the end of the presentation. Um, now this question about, about accepting sales tax payments from the clubs using the district's TIN, uh, I forget what the answer is to that one. I think you want to be careful about mingling. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I guess I would say in that in in this issue, um, you know, as far as I go, as far as my opinion goes on that, the district is separate from the activity fund. Therefore, they the activity fund should not be filing sales tax returns under the district's uh, TIN number. Um, remembering that the district is not subject to sales tax and the extra classroom fund is. Um, as far as will New York State accept sales tax payments, my guess is if you mailed it, they would. <laughs> but um, but is that proper? No. And again, that may be if you're if you're struggling or you have a question about that. In addition to calling uh, taxation and finance, you you may want to also talk about it with with your auditor to just see what they might um, recommend. And then finally, uh, faculty advisors signing deposit slips. I'm not sure that that hurts anything. Uh, the faculty advisor signing the deposit slips. Do you do you have them do that here? Uh, we don't. We don't have the faculty advisor sign the deposit slip, but it's very important that the faculty advisor with the student treasurer sign the receipt form okay. that's being submitted to the central treasurer. So you you want to probably get their you want to get their signature in the process somewhere and and. I'm not sure if you have it more than one place. That necessarily hurts, but you want to get it in there at least somewhere, as, as Linda says, so that you have uh, that, that sense of good internal control. And one more point about that is that the, the deposit slip is more or less after the fact. Um, you know, that, that validated deposit slip will be kept as a supporting record. Um, it's important to have the faculty advisor and student treasurer signing the receipt form that's being submitted to the central treasurer because that's indicating that they both are acknowledging that, for instance, they're handing $500 over to the central treasurer. And, uh, and then there should be a record from the central treasurer going back to the club that indicates that she has received that and deposited it. But I, I, I'm not sure I see where, what um, value the, uh, there is in the advisor signing the deposit slip, unless they're sitting right down with the central treasurer at the same time and preparing the deposit, and I don't think that that happens all too often. Uh, just, just, some, just some information here. Um, there's a commissioner's decision that has to do with extra classroom funds that you can see. Uh, you can go to Office of Council's website from the department and you use decisions and you put in that decision number. Uh, that's, that's an interesting decision because in it the commissioner talks about or he, he expresses concern about what he sees where it appears that a fifth grade activity club is purchasing items that he said would normally be expected of the school district to purchase. And so one of his concerns as you read that decision is about making sure that the kids are certainly voting and um, that they shouldn't be, uh, you know, the extra classroom activity funds should not be a way for the district to get equipment or other items that they themselves either didn't budget for or on a contingency budget so they can't buy the equipment. And so it's an interesting, the decision, and we certainly would uh, point you to that. Uh, the pamphlet that we have spoken about a number of times, um, Finance Pamphlet 2, uh, that's the website where you can find it. Uh, if you 
been out there before, just so you know that the department has changed some of their website addresses. So you see after the www, it's no longer EMSC, it's P12. So if you have the EMSC bookmarked, you might just want to change that to P12. Uh, that was last updated in October of 2008. Um, the Office of Ed Management Services, which is where I work, uh, that's our website. Uh, we have a lot of good information out there about all kinds of topics, and so we certainly would welcome and encourage you to visit our, our website. Uh, if, especially for those who, who had a specific questions as part of this presentation, uh, if you'd like to send me an email, my email address is the letter J, O, C, O, N, N, O, and the number 3 at mail.nysed.gov. So there's no R at the end of my name. It's a 3 instead. And certainly, uh, you're welcome to email me anytime, and I'll do my best to, to get uh, a definitive answer or opinion or uh, commissioner's decision or controller's opinion back to you. The office number is 518-474-6541, and there's no limit on the number of calls, so please call early and call often uh, as much as you need. Uh, finally, the, the number that uh, the gentleman at the Department of Taxation and Finance gave me, uh, if you want to call them and talk to them about a sales tax issue, is 1-800-698-698. 2909. And I don't have a specific name there, but I think if you say you're calling from a school district and you have a question about um, sales tax, then uh, they'll be able to answer your question. I think that does it for our presentation. I know, uh, Anne Marie, you have a question about uh, printing out the slideshow. Uh, I'll just maybe ask Matt from ASBO when he, he's back on to just indicate whether they do that or whether that's something that uh, he needs me to post on our site. But certainly we, we thank you for your, all your participation and certainly uh, welcome any other calls or questions that you might have going forward. And, and with that, Matt, I think we're all set. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Jay. In terms of uh, putting out the material, that's something the uh, attendees would do. When you registered for the course, we did send out registration. Uh, keys for our Moodle online e uh, e-learning website. You would simply go to institute.newyorkasbo.com, log in with your New York ASBO website logon, and then uh, browse to the appropriate page for this webinar. Type I'm sorry, I must have gotten cut off there. Uh, did anyone have any questions? All you have to do is hit seven pound in order to be placed in the voice queue. All right. Thank you all for coming. We do appreciate it.
This conference has not started or has been paused by the moderator. You'll be placed on music hold until the conference begins. The moderator has ended the conference. Goodbye. Thank you for calling.